Good evening and welcome to this quarterly webcast on the um, Methodist Debate Cardiovascular Journal. Um, this webcast occur on a quarterly basis and they are the topics of discussion are around the issue that has just been published. Um, we are looking forward to a very lively discussion of the topic of cardiogenic shock, which is the topic of uh, the journal's issue for this quarter. And uh, hopefully that will generate some uh, comments or questions uh, by you. So don't forget, if you want to ask us any question, just text DBAKEY to 37607. And just send us your question and we'll try to get to them and discuss them. So tonight uh, it's going to be more of an informal discussion. Um, I'm just showing you uh, a printed copy of our journal. Uh, you can also see it online by going to journal.methodist.org. Uh, and uh, the issue this, uh, that is currently circulating um, was uh, devoted to cardiogenic shock. And, and it we shows that because this is an area where there's a lot of new information. Outcomes are gradually improving. P patients, of course, are extremely sick. And in this issue, we have uh, a total of eight papers. And the issue was um, put together by the guest editor, uh, my partner in crime, Dr. Arvin Bimarach, which I will introduce in a minute. Uh, and the eight uh, the eight articles that are in the issues cover pretty much a good part of this entity. We talk about the pathophysiology of advanced hem and the uh, hemodynamic assessment of cardiogenic shock, um, shock in the settings of acute MI, um, shocks in the setting of advanced chronic heart failure, um, also postoperative uh, complications, ca cardiogenic shock in that setting. Um, the management in the intensive care unit, the importance of a team approach. Uh, interestingly, there's an article on the physiology and how much we're learning by using um, pressure volume loops, which uh, is a new concept, which is very interesting. And then a very important uh, article that was written by one of our guests tonight, uh, Maria Patarroyo Aponte, which is on systems of care in cardiogenic shock. Is how do we best uh, optimize uh, in within the community systems to care for these patients. So without any, much, uh, any more delay, I am delighted to introduce um, Arvin Bimaraj. Arvin has been with us uh, close to 10 years. Um, he's an assistant professor at Houston Methodist, but he's also the interim chief of the heart failure division, medical director for advanced heart failure, mechanical assist devices, and heart transplant program at Houston Methodist DeBecky and Cardiovascular Center and a few other things that he does that uh, it will take too long to, to bring in. So I'm delighted to have Arvin uh, join us. Uh, all the panelists tonight have been co-authors of uh, the articles that you all can read if you go to the journal. So without any further delay, Arvin, welcome. I hope you're not too hungry. We're going to be here for at least an hour. Thank you, thank you. And Dr. you inter can introduce our guest. Absolutely, it's been a pleasure. Uh, welcome everybody and it's kind of unprecedented times and I hope everybody is staying safe and literally learning new ways of uh, taking care of patients but also taking care of, you know, of education and interaction. Uh, maintaining social distancing, our guests today are actually safe in their offices uh, and uh, we will introduce them in a minute but it's been a really great honor and pleasure putting this uh, issue together and the spectrum of topics that we were able to cover with the expertise of people who wrote this. I I'm very delighted that my job was easy. I just had to pick up the phone and call them. Um, and I hope we can learn today. And I really encourage all of you to go uh, read some of these articles which are very lucidly written. Um, today uh, on right now available and two of our guests are uh, call of duty. They might join a little later if feasible. Uh, but uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Ju Kim, uh, who is the interim director of our uh, cardiac uh, CCU um, and has been instrumental in uh, essentially helping me 
and develop a, a, a lot of the cardiogenic uh, shock algorithms at our institution. Uh, he's involved actively in uh, research in cardiogenic shock and I look forward to his expertise and he has authored one of the articles talking about uh, pharmacology and pharmacotherapy of shock which doesn't get discussed as much because the, the today's world is filled with mechanical circulatory support. So welcome, Ju. We also Thank have uh, we have Dr. Potaroyo, who is from uh, University of Texas Memorial Hermann, who are our neighbors here, and uh, she has authored a, a a topic which is very extremely relevant and I think kind of futuristic, talking about systems of care for cardiogenic shock. She's uh, assistant professor. Um, over there and I've known her for, for a while from dating back uh, previously from our training. Welcome Maria, thank you for uh, making the time. Thank you. Uh, so, and then we have Dr. Huey Lin, who's my interventional partner and Dr. Eddie Suarez, who hopefully can join us through the discussions if they're able to, because both are on, uh, on call, probably taking care of cardiogenic shock patients in their own, own areas. Dr. Suarez is a cardiothoracic surgeon and an advanced uh, heart failure cardiothoracic surgeon and uh, Dr. Lin is a adult congenital uh, and interventional cardiologist, uh, both closely working with us on the shock team here. So before I kick uh, down some discussion and start with one question here, um, I'd like to reassure all of our viewers that uh, although Dr. Bimaraj and I are not wearing our mask because it's a little difficult to talk with a mask on, we are about 10 feet apart and all the people around us are wearing their mask. So we are staying safe too. So Arvin, um, cardiogenic shock, you know, as an old time clinician, to me basically that meant that somebody was very sick, hypotensive, did not look too good and the heart sucked. But I think we've come along a little more in terms of how we define cardiogenic shock and exactly what is, is as an entity and what criteria do we have for making an accurate diagnosis. So why don't you kick that discussion by just starting with that? Yes, I think that's really the, the beginning of this, this journey in having difficulty in identifying cardiogenic shock. And then I'll engage our panelists in a minute. And that, as Dr. Q has said, uh, for a long time, shock was considered as extremist until you're literally a patient is dying in front of you. We have evolved to a point where we're learning more and more and I personally think even the definition of just blood pressure and hypertension which stems from some of the trial definitions might not really be, be relevant and, and there, there's a lot more to learn um, and, uh, and, and let's hear uh, what uh, Dr. Kim and Maria might uh, um, have in mind. So, Ju, what, what do you think a bedside clinician really needs to keep in mind when you're seeing somebody uh, with cardiogenic shock? And while you're speaking, I'm going to, in the background, have a slide which shows one of the sky classification, which we can also allude to. In one essence, the classification is not a true definition, but it does define some of the aspects that we'll talk about. Yeah, I agree. The, the traditional definitions of cardiogenic shock, at least that's been, in, that's been in the literature, have been mostly clinical trial related definitions. And, and although those have been very helpful in order to establish strict inclusion criteria for research purposes, it's hard to necessarily translate that into the bedside. Um, and part of that, I think, is the fact that cardiogenic shock comes in so many different flavors and phenotypes and etiologies. So that the, the strict criteria of a, a certain blood pressure cutoff may not necessarily suffice. And uh, so I'm glad to see the recent sky classifications come out that, as you see on the slide, emphasizes not only the physical exam findings as well as the, um, the biomarkers uh, indicative of shock, but also incorporates hemodynamics. And as a, as a clinician at the bedside, I think incorporating all of those different things will allow you to really accurately identify the, the shock itself, identify the etiology so that you can appropriately tailor the management. No, that's very valid. And, and, and Maria, to add on to it, being an advanced heart failure uh, uh, practitioner, um, 
maybe you can allude to and uh, beyond the definition, what are, what your thoughts are on hemodynamics, right? We, we're about believers versus non-believers for hemodynamics. Um, what do you think about the hemodynamic definitions of shock? Well, you know, I, I, I have to say the to add to what Dr. Kim say is that people need to understand that the heart, uh, cardiogenic shock is a continuous and you can develop one phase to the next very fast. So the first thing that everybody needs to understand is this is not something that you leave to just check every, every day, it's something that you need to be on top of the patient. As a heart failure cardiologist, we believe a lot of hemodynamics, but you also need to know how to interpret those hemodynamics. So uh, as long as uh, people in the community is able to uh, check uh, the clinical findings on the patient and make sure that uh, the laboratories that they are available for them are there and they can see the changes faster, uh, that's the most important thing. I think the hemodynamics could be a double-edged uh, problem uh, if you don't know how to interpret them and what to do when you are seeing the numbers on uh, on the swan guns. But I, I like to just ask, when you approach a patient that has been brought to you that obviously is not smiling, it doesn't look good, what are your first kind of ABCs of evaluating that patient that imme helps you within reasonable short time say, this guy is in cardiogenic shock? before you put swan guns and do everything. I mean, just st straightforward bedside, three or four clues that you say, this guy, chances are very high in cardiogenic shock. Then you can get the echo, you can do the swan guns. But what would be the clues at the bedside that you would But well, I think uh, tachycardia for yeah. once. Yeah. And then the pulse pressure, you know, yeah. if you can be 120 over 100 of blood pressure, that pulse pressure is already very narrow. That patient is trying to compensate for a low stroke Tachycardia, volume. low pulse pressure, okay. I think those those are very easy to see for everybody. I mean, the patient is clammy or she's vasoconstricted. Um, I think that that will be the first two things that you look at. And, you know, I think uh, urine, if the patient is making urine or not, that gives you a better idea of what is going on with the patient. That's what I would say One point really that, fast. Yeah. One point that might be worth uh, mentioning is that um, occasionally, I mean, today, tonight, we're probably going to talk mostly of people who have very bad hearts for whatever reason. Um, at least for a moment, it could be transient, but the heart is not working well. But occasionally, we get people that are in cardiogenic shock with an ejection fraction of 65 percent, because they either have they either either have wide open mitral regurg, uh, big VSD from an MI, or occasionally we've seen people that have uh, LV alpha obstruction, um, and they have this ventricle that is super working, but uh, the output is, is bad and they are in hypotensive because, uh, and in those cases you don't want to give anotrope because you can make it worse, but. One point I think should, we should bring to the audience is uh, that when you examine these people, particularly those with VSDs and MR, they might not have a, a, a good murmur to hear. Uh, sometimes the murmurs can be very, very tough to hear, particularly if you're in a busy ICU, surrounding noise, uh, and other devices around that can't, uh, can't um, cause uh, problems with uh, auscultation. So keep in mind always, that there is a small subgroup of patients that can be very, very sick, meeting criteria clinically for cardiogenic shock, and yet have a good function because the problem is of another type, which requires other type of treatments. I think tonight we're going to be dealing more with these sick hearts, but I think it's good to bring that point. Um, so if you don't hear a good MR murmur, that doesn't mean the patient may not have a blown mitral valve or, or a VSD. Yeah, and, and I think it's important to recognize that th there it's, De detecting cardiogenic shock is a combination of elements and it's about critical thinking and suspecting cardiogenic shock and getting rid of our uh, learning from before that you have to look at the blood pressure only but when you say go go to the bedside and as maria was pointing out um, touching the patient gives a lot of information and sometimes we miss that uh, right. And another thing, personally, that I, there's no evidence. I've noticed, uh, uh, there, I call it the kneecap sign. A lot of patients have cold kneecaps, but the feet are not as, as, uh, as cold. I've also gotten fooled by people who are warm, but when you take them to the lab and their index is like 1.2. 
So unfortunately, the chronic patients, especially acute and chronic patients, have a compensatory mechanism. So there's definitely suspicion with physical exam, the vital signs that uh, Maria pointed out, and then lab, uh, laboratory examinations of, you know, suspicion of end organ perfusion. And it comes down to that. And then, to your point, sometimes old school thought is, you know the patient is in shock, so why do you need to do a swan gans? That's, uh, that's the argument that we have. Uh, but it comes down to appropriate uh, management and appropriate response to what you treat. If, or if there's a conflict of, uh, of, the, uh, of the diagnosis that you have in mind. Uh, but, but you brought up a good point and maybe a little bit of digression from the definition. These cohorts of patients who have mechanical complications, when you come in with an acute MI, have an MR, acute MR, um, or you have a VSD, those need a high index of suspicion. And I think timely, I see Dr. Suarez as able to get off from his call of duty and he's, he's joined in. Um, he's our, our surgeon extraordinaire who does hearts, lungs, heart, lungs, and VADs. They've been very busy. Thank you, Eddie, for making time for us. Uh, but this really comes down that discussion. I have a patient who came in post MI. I'm suspecting acute MR. The guy is hypotensive. The first thing that comes to my mind is where's my surgeon? This guy got, got to go to the OR. But we always talk about how sick they are that they won't make it out of it. And then comes the question, how do you support them? So what are, what are your thoughts in somebody in that cohort of patients who have mechanical complications after acute MI, how do, you, how do you think we should support them so you can actually operate on them successfully? It depends on the etiology. Like, I mean, having an echo, having the, you, you guys help with the diagnosis is, is, is primary. Obviously, someone has uh, a, a, a a wide open AI versus someone who's got like a post op VSD, you, you, you can manage it differently. Someone ha who, for example, someone who does have a VSD before, we used to not uh, use something such as an impella, something that would, would help with the uh, uh, with the cardiogenic shock out of fear for, of shunting. But now we've learned that we can we can do that. Whereas someone who has like you know wide open AI, I get very concerned for using something mechanical such as an. Uh, ECMO or, or very many options. It limits the options you have. So the etiology of, of the of the cardiogenic jock is 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 primary. What is the mechanical um, deficiency that's causing him to, to be in that state? But someone who's acutely sick, you don't have any time. Obviously, I think you and I both know the the mainstay for us has been ECMO if they're an appropriate candidate. Being arterial uh, ECMO helps, even though it may not help the heart much. It does support the body, and it, and it, it uh, takes over for the circulation where the heart can't, and it can put in bedside and can be put in quickly. Um, that's usually how I go about it. So I, I since I played the role here of the uh, um, all-time clinician, I grew up at a time when we uh, didn't think twice about putting a swing guns. And um, Maria made a very important comment earlier when she said, you know, Managing cardiogenic shock is not the type of patient that you see in the morning, then you go to your clinic and you see them the next day. This is really a moment by moment decision making in how you manage them. And I always found that the Swan Gans catheter gave me that information that without it, you, you felt like you, I didn't know what was going on. Then look recently now, trials came out and they threw kind of like a cold water on the whole thing because they said, well, the outcomes are not any better. In fact, they could be worse. So so where are we in, 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 in this uh, type of uh, controversy? Do we pass a swan or not? I'd like to, but now there's data that makes me think that maybe we were not doing the right thing. Arvin and pa pa uh, panel, what do you all think? Ju, you want to you wanna address, so I think, I think uh, we actually have a question that's coming in from the audience and that's probably relevant. Oh to, yeah, there to, it is. To swan actually. or no swan, actually. Yeah. Swan yeah. or no swan, Perfect. what is your opinion on why the utilization of swan gans catheters has not really been widespread in cardiogenic shock? I think it stems to a lot of these discussions we are having. Oh, <coughs> I, I would certainly in favor on the, on the side of swan, but I think Dr. Padareo made a, made a good point earlier that it's, it's fine to have a swan gans, but what's more important is accurate assessment and interpretation of the data. And I think 
part of the the hesitance of using a swan GANS catheter may be related to the fact that not not everybody is familiar uh, with the intricacies of uh, managing a swan GANS catheter, identifying which hemodynamic parameters are most relevant. But it, I, as we're discussing here, a cardiogenic shock comes in again so many different phenotypes that. I really truly believe that accurate hemodynamic assessment is crucial to truly identify exactly what the uh, the, the shock is from, and it, it it really does help you guide the the management of it. So uh, my vote's always for a swan. Um, I, I really don't see it, uh, a harm from it. So, so <laughs> maybe and, and, and before you know, you made a very important point because it's not passing this one. It's knowing how to measure properly, very importantly, and how to then assess those hemodynamics, interpret them appropriately for decision making. I may add, the same thing is for an echo. Everybody in the CCU that doesn't look good gets an echo. Doing it is the easy part. Having an accurate interpretation is the same as a swan. You know, to help you guys, the person interpreting that echocardiogram really has to have the expertise to likewise because there are subtle things that can be happening in an echocardiogram in somebody cardiogenic shock that if you are not careful you can miss so uh, i think with any of these techniques it's very important to make that point you need to know and how I'm to sure use them you need to know the, how to the interpret events. them and and then you can get proper uh, value of it however <laughs> the problem is that we assume that the trials that were done with and without sam uh swan guns um Hopefully, were done by people who knew how to use s one GANs. So you still have that controversy that at the end of the day, uh, the outcomes have not been necessarily much better. So, so I think I think it's probably important to address that question. I, I, you you brought a very good word that there was cold water on the on the Swan GANs concept. So the limitations of the old data, the old ICU data. Of course, doesn't make sense if you put in swan and everybody who has a neck, it's not going to work, right? <laughs> so the sepsis data goes out of the drain. Right. The escape trial also, I think, was not the right cohort. Everybody who comes in with acute heart failure, if you do a swan, it's not useful. Right. And if you I go to go be purist and look at the guidelines, the guidelines actually very clearly say do it in people who you think you need to. The bad press that comes with SWAN as reflected by everybody is if you don't know how to use the information, I call it garbage in, garbage out, you might be the smartest, the wrong information will make you do wrong decisions. So with, with that, I actually, let's look at this slide and maybe, I, I, I'm, I don't know if Maria, if you can see these slides. Yeah. Um, the one that I portrayed with the, with the SWAN GANs, you know, and, and this is a simple thing. When you have the monitor, that's showing up uh, on the uh, on the screen. Um, you have two indexes of cardiac output, right? You have a saturation in this slide that's showing 82 percent, and then the output is 6.2. That's probably uh, similar, but there are times where you walk into the unit and that venous saturation tells you 92 percent, but the index that's coming up is 1.2, so. Now already you have a disparate information. What do you trust? How do you troubleshoot when the two outputs are off? Right? So, so it's it's accuracy of the information. The question becomes maybe one of you can uh, talk, uh, Maria. You can talk about what. How do you use the output information? And if you need to confirm it, how do you verify it? Well, uh, you know, I I think cardiac up is. It's a little bit tricky, you know, to know your patient. I'm going to tell you an example. I had a patient with a BSD, and I come to the ICU, and the saturation on the monitor is 82. If I get the PA catheter, it's going to be 82. They have to ask the nurses, give me the CVP saturation. Obviously, there's a churn, the step up on the saturation there. Right. But if let's say that it's real, there is not a chunk or anything there, I usually prefer to... Uh, check the saturation and then adjust it. Um, now, I have to say that's not a perfect um, definition, uh, not, not a perfect measure if you account that metabolic changes are happening in ICU and your peak is really not a, a perfect calculation on those patients. Uh, but I think more than one measure 
what you need to do is the continuous and what is happening. You know, you cannot go from 80 to a minute and not do any intervention and then be 50 if nothing happens. The same way you cannot be 30 and not changing anything and be 60 later. So also I think it's not just the cardiac output. In, 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 when you have a swan gas, you have to be uh, careful on all the parameters because all of them are gonna be equally important. You're telling me your CVP is 7 and your wedge is 10 and your cardiac index is 1.2. Something is not matching there, you know. So I personally try to always ask for the SVO2 coming from the blood gases to compare with the machine and see that they are appropriate and make sure that the other numbers that are coming from this one make sense with that cardiac output that I'm getting. I don't know what the other people think. So I think those are excellent points, but to add to Ms. Dr. Quinone's point, a swan band's catheter is not a treatment. It is not aspirin, it is not a beta blocker, it doesn't do anything to, to, the, to the body or, or the person. The treatment is the physician, the swan gans, and like an echocardiogram, they are diagnostic tools to assist the physician. So yeah, and that's what I'm saying. You have to look at all the parameters. You cannot come and say, I'm looking at this one. You need to look at the patient. You need to know your diagnosis, and then you need to know everything together. So so it assists uh, like a doctor to better treat the, the, the patient itself. And I, I would recommend a swan catheter, but more important, learn how to use a swan catheter. I think it will make you a better cardiologist. I think it will treat your, your patients better. It will think, make you a better physician, and, and that's that's for me, the, the takeaway. It's not the swan that treats the patient, not the swan that makes the, the patient better. It's a doctor who knows how to use use it. It's a doctor who knows how to use the echocardiogram to, to make better decision, informed decisions. That's that's what makes the outcome better. Uh, so, and that, Marvin, if you, if you can show the, I think the next slide that you have, uh, I think it's slide number four, uh, I think perfectly illustrates this point. Uh, this is a picture of one of our intensivists, actually the director of all intensive care services at Methodist, uh, getting down on the ground to make sure that the transducers are leveled and zeroed appropriately, because uh, some of you can, can make up the waveforms that are on the screen there, but those are not accurate. So you can walk in, glance at this, uh, you know, just the numbers and think, oh my goodness, the CVP is 18. but Again, I think as we're all pointing out, it is important to make sure that you get accurate data in. You know exactly what this tool is it providing you and interpret it correctly and put it in the right context of all the other things that we're seeing, physical exam, laboratory markers, your overall clinical judgment so that you make the right therapeutic decision on behalf of your patient. Are we showing that slide four? Is the audience seeing that? Yeah, yeah the, I think the slide that Dr. Kim is talking about, uh, hopefully the audience can see, um, the, the blue line is uh, the supposed to be CVP. So if we walk in and presume the blue line is a CVP, it, it might not be true. You have to make sure that it is a CVP. Just because the computer is telling you CVP, it's not. It's actually into the RV. Uh, right, the waveform of the blue line is very clear that it, the swan is too deep, and uh, as Dr. Kim was pointing out, uh, that was actually a candid picture I took of one of our uh, head of our intensivists. He didn't know I was doing it, so everybody needs to know. And as Dr. Suarez pointed out, we have to invest in this, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why uh, swan gans has not been validated is as as professionals, we've not invested in demystifying this and educating everybody at the bedside saying, be systematic, do these calculations, uh, look at the, uh, all the hemodynamics, and then use it to interpretation. So hopefully that culture is changing. And to go back to what Dr. Quinones was pointing out, there is data that's emerging. Uh, the Detroit Shock Initiative, and uh, some of the MCS data that uh, the Impella guys are, are have, the databases, are actually showing that if you have a swan gans and you treat them with, with swan gans guidance, you make better decisions, which is in fact translating into better outcomes. So I, I can see the time where 
it will become a, a recommendation that if you're treating cardiogenic shock, you should treat it with, with the swan gans catheter once we invest appropriately. So we want to be sure that we do have enough time tonight to get into treatment because obviously there's got a lot of important things. But before we do that, I'd like to ask the following question because it does reflect treatment. So we could divide cardiogenic shock into two broad categories, acute. You were healthy until the day you had acute MI, bang, now you're in cardiogenic shock. Or you were healthy until the day you became acutely ill with myocarditis and now you're deadly ill in cardiogenic shock. So those are the acute. Or you had surgery and you come out of the OR and things are not looking good. So you have this acute situation, which is the categories of acute MI, myocarditis, post-op complications, uh, valvular complications. And then you have the other big group that is growing, which is chronically sick people, heart failure, that then advance, advance, and now they're coming in a level of so advanced that they're in cardiovascular shock. So anything known about how fr the frequency of these entities, number one, and number two, uh, do the managements vary a lot? Or are they, at the end of the day, they're all very sick and you treat them all about the same? Yes, uh, and, and it's actually very well written in one of the articles in the journal talking about how advanced heart failure who are acute and chronic physiologically are very different. Management strategies are different. Physiological responses are different. Um, so I, you know, I'd like to um, you know, hear Maria's opinion. They have a very robust shock program. Um, and how, how do you, uh, all the data that we talk about with balloon pumps, impellas, that, that's robustly done, the randomized trials, talk about a different cohort, right? They're all acute MI population. But our patients, some of them, we are advanced heart failure who are 10 years, 15 years of chronic heart failure. They come in in acute heart failure and go into shock. What do you think the differences are and how they respond and, and what do you need to plan accordingly? And uh, uh, Maria, what are your thoughts on it? Well, I think it's uh, part is the reserve of your organs. Uh, I think when you have a more acute settings, your uh, or organs probably have a better reserve. Saying that uh, patients with uh, chronic heart failure, um, they will uh, probably also uh, have some, they have been adjusted the wedge pressure and other things for uh, a long time. So I think, um, I personally believe it's easier when you manage a patient that comes with chronic heart failure than when you have an acute uh, infarct with a VSD and the patient doesn't have a, a I mean, it has not been adjusted to that. Um, obviously, uh, we always uh, prefer to escalate therapy on, I think it's easier to escalate therapy in acute on chronic heart failure I think on patients with acute cardiogenic shock with uh, previously normal, it's easier just then to go to the maximum and then de-escalate therapy. Uh, there are two completely different situations and uh, I, I think it just depending on how chronic it is and that the patients with acute on chronic heart failure, uh, they will respond better to some measurements that are not as uh, advanced like patients with acute heart failure with previously not problems. Ju, and, and I think you know, a, a part of the cohort of advanced heart failure is the realism of whether they're going to survive this or not. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, typically, they have multi-organ failure, and, and in that context, apart from the physiology, the systems of care in, the, in, in making sure that are we going to continue to escalate, are we going to de-escalate, when are we going to have a conversations of palliation and hospice, um, and uh, uh, Ju, as a ICU director, you're all the way in them. Uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts on how to incorporate these tough discussions? Because on one hand, we're always, we don't want to give up on patients appropriately. And everybody looks sick in the ICU, so you can't say they're sick, so we're going to give up. But on the other hand, practically, where do you draw the line? You know, it's, it's a a difficult discussion all the time, um, but you know, getting back to the acute versus chronic uh, heart failure patients or the acuity of presentation of shock, you know, at the end of the day, shock again just manifests with inadequate organ perfusion. So, the the initial management 
you can say is, is the same, which is to restore that end organ perfusion. And if it's acute, then I would argue that you may have even more options to try and reverse what may be uh, causing or leading the, to the diagnosis of shock. For example, and we can get Dr. Suarez's input on this, but if we are examining uh, or evaluating a patient who presented with an acute uh, onset cardiogenic shock due to an identifiable cause, um, resuscitative measures of mechanical support such as ECMO may be more relevant or uh, accessible uh, as opposed to that patient who's had chronic symptoms, chronic heart failure, uh, as Dr. Paterio has suggested, that may have already had chronic kidney disease or chronic hepatic congestion that would uh, sort of require some second thoughts about uh, escalation to include therapy such as ECMO. So, you know, when, as a heart failure cardiologist, we do run into a lot of these uh, chronic heart failure patients that ultimately decompensate and can come in critically ill. There is a, a careful assessment of all the end organ functions, as well as this uh, a, a concept of an exit strategy, if you will. How are we going to get this patient out of the shock state, uh, number one, and then what is gonna be the, the maintenance strategy going forward? And I think those discussions should be multidisciplinary between heart failure cardiologists, the critical care intensivists, uh, as well as the surgeons, um, so that uh, it, it really truly becomes a well thought out and multidisciplinary discussion. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, I completely agree, of course. And, and what he's saying about an uh, acute, uh, uh, acute decompensation is very appropriate because someone who acutely decompensates, something happened, and hopefully you can say uh, whatever happened is reversible, hasn't been going on for a long time, or you've been trying to change it for years, it's something that happened relatively quickly, and if you save their life right now and then and, and restore perfusion to their the body, hopefully you can do something about it and fix it quickly versus something that's been a chronic problem that probably isn't going to go away by, by putting in the mechanical device. You may uh, hopefully get past the acute stage, but someone that's something that's been a chronic problem, it's probably gotten worse by this second hit, it's taken by this acute uh, acute decompensation, and you need to know if there's a way out of it. So when it's been chronically sick, are you able to do something that will support them long term? Uh, because these devices and, and support we have for the shock is is an acute treatment, it's something that helps them So now and then. It's not something that's going to be helping them down six months from now, most likely. So you do need to be, like you said, think about it in a multidisciplinary fashion. And, and have kind of protocols set in place before you're faced with the situation so that you know what you're going to do when you face uh, a similar uh, a similar event. You know how to deal with the complication before it happens and you're not scrambling and everyone's very emotional trying to decide whether to do something or not. You think about what you'll have to do before you have to face that complication. So we have um, received two questions from the outside that are right on to take us to the next part of this webcast, which is, of course, managing, treating the patient, try to get them out of the cardiogenic shock and hopefully eventually home. So uh, again, I grew up in an era where all we had were inotropes. Uh, we argued uh, between uh, epinephrine, dobutamine, dopamine. Um, and then uh, years later, the uh, intraortic balloon came in and uh, we thought that was a big help. Uh, but now we're in an era where you still have the drugs and uh, you have a lot of choices for mechanical assist. So we actually got two questions along those lines. One was along the lines of drug medications. Have anything new come up in, in terms of choices there? Do we have some guidelines of how, what can help us decide on um, drug A versus drug B? And then, the, of course, the other question was um, how do we choose? Uh, between all the different mechanical devices and in what kind of settings they will be applicable. I think we should tackle those two questions because both are very important for management and, and hopefully for a better outcome. Who wants to tackle that first? Well, very relevant and I, and I think we'll start with Dr. Kim who's our CCU director about the pharma, pharmacotherapy um, and then we can segue, this, today is time's flowing perfectly. I see Dr. Lin who's our interventional cardiologist who I said was on call of duty also is on. We'll start with Dr. Kim about medications and then Dr. Lin will answer balloon pump versus Impella. What do you choose when somebody comes in with shock? All right. So, Jube. 
<laughs> so, Dr. Quinones, unfortunately, all the medication tools or pharmacotherapy tools that you mentioned are still the tools that are available today. And unfortunately, there's really a scarcity of uh, good randomized data to say that we should choose one versus another. And, and, and again, I think it all comes down to you know, good identification and interpretation of the hemodynamics to guide which agent is first. So if you get uh, invasive hemodynamics that suggest that uh, uh, the, the patient actually has a more of a distributed form of shock, for example, and the SVR is very low, perhaps a, a vasopressor agent may be the first thing you, you reach for. Um, as opposed to if it's a truly a cardiogenic only component of shock and the SVR is very high with a low cardiac output and elevated filling pressures, then perhaps you'd be uh, uh, led more to the inotropic agent as the first uh, support. Um, so unfortunately, there, there really is kind of this scarcity of good data to say that this should be agent number one, this agent should be number two, it really does come down to the clinical assessment, the hemodynamic assessment to guide is there is there any room for a cautious use of vasodilators? And if so, which would be the setting that you would feel it would be more appropriate, if any? So I, I think vasodilators will get tricky, but I think there's a role in vasodilators of in, in, in patient, in, in situations what I call as probably hypertensive shock, and that sounds like an oxymoron statement, <laughs> but we all do that, and if somebody's index is 1.2 and an SVR is 3,000, I think those are individuals, despite a map which is not that high, there's an option probably to use nipride, and, and there's some studies related to that. Um, but coming back to uh, uh, Ju's point, Data is limited. For what mm -hmm. it's worth, I think SOAP and SOAP2 are kind of two studies which were more in the shock realm, but when you look at sub-analysis, in cardiogenic shock, interestingly, uh, norepi showed a little bit of benefit. But it comes down to practicality, and we don't talk about it as much, but if you're in an ICU and somebody's blood pressure is 70, it doesn't matter which one, there's no evidence. Get what you have next to maintain the blood pressure. But what's being very well validated is don't presume it's going to work and leave them on pressors. Right. MCS has become the mainstay, but in the short term, you have to do what you have to do and then very quickly move on to mechanical support because, uh, and then we'll talk a little about MCS and choices, which will, is the next discussion that Huey will address. But I think we've learned that We've spent all our life about shock and the rest of the body. We talk about urine output, liver, brain. But by putting in a mechanical support, we're trying to rest the heart. I think we have forgotten about myocardial energetics. We've forgotten that the heart's getting beat up when you're in shock. And uh, you know, with that, actually, what was the choice? There's so many mechanical supports now. And, and then the slide that I have up there shows a few of the percutaneous supports. And maybe Huey, you can, uh, Dr. Lin is our uh, interventional cardiologist and adult congenital director of our adult congenital program. Um, he's doing this daily. What would be your choice of support if uh, it comes to an individual who's in shock in front of you? And maybe that can be broken down into STEMI in the cath lab or you get called to the ICU or to the ER, what would you do? Yeah, and, and I think the answer to that is very contextually based, right? So I think um, first we'll talk about it from sort of a scientific slash cardiac output and requirement standpoint. And that is, and I think you guys have probably already talked a lot about this, but I think, you know, talking about myocardial energetics, talk about, talking about left ventricular unloading, lowering the LVEDP in the setting of STEMI, um, and really reducing the myocardial oxygen requirement um, is really the goal uh, um, and can really get you out of a lot of trouble, whether that's ventricular arrhythmias, um, uh, cardiogenic shock, et cetera. So I think typically um, easiest and fastest um, and probably answering that question in my mind um, and typically at our institution is the impella um, because you can get 3.5 potentially four liters of support very quickly 
And typically we can get that in in about maybe five to 15 minutes, depending on the situation, depending on the patient's situation. Um, so I think from, um, from a scientific slash data slash um, thinking about the patient standpoint, that's kind of where I would lean towards, um, especially because I think a lot of people are leaning away from introverted balloon pump for acute cardiogenic shock and STEMI. But on the other hand, I think it's also very important to think about the individual operator. Um, I think the first question is, you know, what's, what does the patient actually need? The second question is, what is the individual operator capable of doing? And when is it um, time to call for help? So I think if the individual operator is not going to be comfortable with large bore access and potentially going to spend, you know, 30 minutes to an hour trying to put in an impella, um, and then have a vascular complication from that, I think that that's not the answer. I think the impella is not the right answer for that operator, for that patient. I think the answer is what are, is the operator able to put in, and probably most operators can put in a balloon pump, and then immediately escalate care. So whether that's transferred to a center that can be capable of um, additional um, advanced therapies, such as durable mechanical support, um, or uh, impella, or tandem heart, et cetera. I think there are other unique situations where I think um, um, other devices like the tandem heart can be very helpful. And for us, um, at least in our environment, I think that that's been very helpful for patients who have additional issues, such as, for example, a, a ventricular rupture in the setting of a ST elevation myocardial infarction. Um, other situations where we found it helpful is, unfortunately, we have patients who also have um, concomitant mitral stenosis and other mitral um, uh, abnormalities, um, where you can really get rapid left atrial unloading. <clears throat> and I think the other really nice thing uh, about uh, a system like uh, like Tandem Heart is that it allows you very quickly to sort of convert to um, uh, oxygenation as well when that becomes an, uh, an issue. Um, and uh, so then I think the third area to talk about is when you really need to consider biventricular support. And again, I think it really becomes important um, for us to separate you know, the theory from the practical reality. I mean, I think the theory is that if a patient has indications of going into right heart failure in the setting of uh, acute STEMI cardiogenic shock and left side of support is not sufficient, you know, the operator has to think a lot about what are they going to do to get them right side of support. Right side of support can be challenging for patient for operators who don't typically use right side of support. So Impella RP can be challenging to place. Protect Duo can be challenging to place if you don't typically do cannulations and you don't typically place, you know, 31 French devices in the, you know, in the pulmonary artery. And so I think it's important to think what's um, theoretically necessary, which is to address the right side of support issue. But I also think that it's also important to think practically. So if an operator is only comfortable with um, medium bore access, only has experience with an intraoretic balloon pump, then that's what you've got. Introverted balloon pump, package the patient up, transfer them to a tertiary quaternary center, or call in another operator who is comfortable with um, a more advanced mechanic, uh, per case mechanical support. I do think you know transferring to a tertiary quaternary center is probably you know something that should be on the back of everybody's mind when um, if they're on their own and they can't do any of these other uh, additional mechanical support devices. Um, so important to always think what are my own personal limitations, institutional limitations, limitations of what's what's available for resources at that particular moment in the context of the patient needs, and then what are the other resources that are available around you and how do you operate to that? One question I would like to ask is that um, not all of these devices have the same time-lasting benefit, in other words, you can put a balloon, and if you're careful and control infection, you can have somebody in a balloon for a long time. In fact, I remember one of our heart transplant patients who lived for about 12 years after his heart transplant spent a month in a balloon before he got the transplant. So we can do that. But in Pellas, maybe you can do a week. The question is, tandem hearts, how long you can keep them? ECMOs. So in the decision making of going to these devices, is it also important to think in terms of for how long we can keep it before we get into the secondary complications of having those devices. So I'd like to have some thoughts from some of you guys on, on that. Well, I, I think when we decide what we're gonna do, we, as, at least as a heart failure transplant cardiologist, we are always thinking, is this gonna be a bridge to what? Are we expecting this patient to get better? 
yeah. are we expecting this patient to require something else and is that patient going to be a candidate for that so uh, whenever we, we start to do this mechanical circulatory support uh, we have to do it for the patient right away but at, at the same time we are thinking uh, is this a bridge to something or this is just uh, something that is not going to take the patient to any point because you know at least um, that is important also when we talk about resources uh, I think in the community the idea as Dr. Lim says if you are comfortable with balloon pump just do the balloon pump send the patient to a tertiary center but when the patient comes to us it's more about uh, what is the mechanical support take this patient to it's going to take him to a more definite treatment it's going to be just for the patient to recover or this patient is going to need something like a tra heart transplant or a LVAD. So that also be has to be part of the discussion. The yeah. new impellas that we have, and we can do the 5 impellas, so they uh, allow the patients to walk and move. So that's, that's all the things that you have to take in account when you are doing all these devices is, uh, are you expecting this device to be for a long time and how it's going to be that impacting the patient in terms of reconditioning uh, nutritional status and other things. Yeah, I think the theme of decision making that's been brought up is important to acknowledge a cardiogenic shock is not just cardiogenic shock, a pump is not just a pump. You have to know what kind of shock you're treating and what kind of pump physiologically will be best and then what kind of strategy you're, as Dr. Quinones was talking about, um, if you're in advanced heart failure cohort and you think you need to go to a VAD or transplant and you're bridging them, you need something where they're not confined to bed. So. Uh, right now, um, you know, we have uh, our, we, we've just published our recent experience of percutaneous axillary balloon pumps where we've left it in almost six to seven months in some individuals. Yeah. And then as Maria was pointing out, their center and even our center, we're doing a lot of 5.5 and 5.0 impellas in the axillary where they're staying in the hospital until they get a transplant or get optimized for VAD. And Dr. Suarez is, uh, is our expert in that where um, you know, we're able to ambulate people. So your choice becomes uh, focused on your strategy in those situations. Um, and uh, people are innovating as time goes by. So I think as, as we have been giving you some information and you've been listening to uh, the, our discussion, it becomes very clear that these people are pretty sick. And that um, a lot of thought has to be made into how we treat them and the role of the clinician who knows the patient and the family is crucial. Uh, looking for reversible f uh, possi possibilities is so important. Uh, as Maria pointed out, um, having some sort of exit uh, uh, plan, i.e. bridge to transplant or, or LVAD or something, because otherwise you can get into a, into a domino effect of going from one thing to another. At the end, you, you're trapped in a situation that uh, becomes very bad for patients, families, and everything else. The other thing that it has become very clear is that management of these patients require a lot of expertise. And it's hard to always be able to do that in a 100-bed small community hospital. Which brings us to this important topic that we wanted to cover tonight, which is what are the evolving thoughts in system of cares? And how should we, a community, be prepared to manage this kind of uh, very sick patients and uh, Maria uh, tackled that uh, topic in the journal. She wrote a beautiful paper on that, so we'd like uh, you to give us some thoughts on that because I, you have given it a fair amount of thought to it. Well, um, so, you know, uh, I think this is uh, something that is relatively new. Um, it uh, requires a lot of education, and I think that was the most important part of the topic was education is important, and is education to recognize when you have to move the patient to another, uh, another setting. Uh, it's difficult because, as we have, have mentioned before, cardiogenic shock can present on a different mix, um, and it's not like the ST elevation MI that you have something that is uh, unique that you can Im uh, immediately evaluate. But it comes about education in terms of how to recognize when the patient is not doing well, how to recognize that that patient needs further escalation of care. And then beyond that, it requires to have the ability to transport those patients. Uh, and it, it has the ability 
of uh, having um, also uh, families involved on that. Uh, geographic areas, some geographic areas don't have anything around and then it becomes cumbersome for the patients and the families. Um, and, you know, I think at the end it comes about uh, all of us be able to uh, recognize that. And I think the sky classification help us a lot. Uh, it's more for people in the community to understand this, this is where you are, this is where you can go. And if you are moving from one stage to another, maybe that's the time to move and send the patient out. The, the problem will become when everybody comes to the tertiary center, you know, because obviously we have certain amount of uh, capacity and getting those patients that are not requiring that much support can just take the capacity for patients that require other support. So it, it has become a problem. I think uh, it's more about people recognizing when the patient is in some type of shock that can still be managed in the community and when the patient is progressing to something that requires more advanced therapies. Um, and obviously don't overwhelm the tertiary centers with patients that really don't need uh, too much of the, that care. So it, it's, it's a little bit of uh, complicated. Um, we try to uh, explore what are the, the experiences in our centers like Arizona and how they come with certain uh, algorithms to decide is this patient appropriate to come to the Shai Center? That is this patient able to stay there? And I think at the end it will be communication. You know, if you, the Shai Center can communicate with other centers and give them some guidance and go along with them on the management of the patient, that also will help not to overload us, but also to transfer the patient that really need to be here, not too late or not too early. That you don't know, we don't know what we're gonna do with it. So with the COVID um, pandemic. Um we have learned a lot about uh, managing patients uh, through virtual management. And here at Houston Method is actually, we, start, we started the program of uh, the virtual ICU where we have uh, an expert ICU physician managing multiple patients in a, in a virtual f uh, fashion. Is this an area where this technology could really help support these more hospitals, uh, helping them make the right decision as to when to transfer and whatnot? What's, what's going on in the development of this type of virtual technology in a, in a community like Houston or, or any other city? Well, I think COVID uh, in, uh, teach us all that we are not that advanced on that, on that part of the telemedicine, to be true. Um, I think it, it will be helpful, you know, I think it's helpful when we communicate and when we su support other people in terms of knowing what is going on. I think once the patient is going to mechanical support uh, because it's a technical uh, issue and re requires some expertise, that patient should be moving from the place they are. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, I think it's important communication, try to see what is going on, try to give some guidance and then see if the patient is improving or not. So it I requires think a lot of care and a lot of uh, time from both centers. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I think we are very... Uh, we're not very advanced on the telemedicine part, uh, as much or as much as we wanted to be. So, Arvin, I think you, Arvin put a slide. I don't know if the audience can see it, but you may want to take us to that slide because it's kind of like a conceptual slide of. of yeah, I think I have the slide up which Dr. Patraya has in her article, which really describes what she was talking about. And I think to add on to what she said, it's really incumbent on organizing care for for shock because. Um, and, and think not just that in, we're talking about shock teams within an institution, which is extremely important, but beyond the institution, I think shock needs to be organized at a multi-institutional level with policy which drives care. And, and unfortunately, if, a, if an individual ends up in a, in a hospital which has minimal mechanical support, say even in STEMI, and that's happening today, it happened personally to to one of my relatives uh, in a STEMI situation who the facility just had a balloon pump and it was not used because there's no evidence and then essentially acute MI, you pass away on a table. That is a situation where policy should drive bypassing an institution to be able to go to a place where you can deliver the right care. Uh, so I think this model which reflects that you can have different levels of care and organize care in institutions which can be certified that you can provide certain amount of care 
also needs to be a policy level and I hope that will come as time goes by because there's more and more evidence that's coming up that organizing care helps. Uh, that's what Detroit Shock Initiative has done. Uh, I we have one. Yeah. Sorry. Go. I think showing that slide, I just remember that cardiogenic shock goes beyond uh, the hospital for these patients. You know, when they get discharged, they are very deconditioned. They need sometimes LTAC, skilled nursing facilities, rehab. And all of that has to be embedded on these patients. They need nutrition. Um, so it, it becomes cumbersome from the families, you know, because obviously these families, especially in Texas area, are coming from very far uh, places, you know, for the family and the patient. It's also something that they need to take in account when they are transferring the patient. And um, that is not, I just want to show on that slide that everything on cardiogenic show doesn't stop just with discharging the patient. It requires further care. And probably that care sometimes is going to be more prolonged than just the hospital care. That's a very important point. I'm really happy that you made that. Uh, patients survive, we all feel good about it, we pat ourselves in the back, and then patient goes out, and if nothing is done to support them, they, they, can, they can do very poorly. Uh, so I, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's a very important point. We have maybe about, about a minute left, so any of the panelists wants to make any other closing points? Uh, any other yeah, thoughts Dr. you have? Can you just, just <coughs> I, think, I think two thoughts. Um, in, in terms of the education that's necessary um, for you know all the physicians and, and uh, all of us combined, you know cardiogenic shock. Unfortunately, there's not a single marker like ST elevations on an EKG that really says this is something that's urgent that needs to be addressed. So I think uh, education in that standpoint is important. To address your point of the incorporating virtual ICU and these telemedicine uh, capabilities. I, I think there is going to be a role for that. We're, we're planning at least uh, to incorporate telemedicine uh, ICU capabilities in system hospitals throughout, for example, at Methodist, so that we can actually go in and identify those patients early and triage them appropriately and get them to the tertiary or quaternary center um, so that we can uh, provide the appropriate level of support. And then the final thing is I think it's important to note, at least here at Methodist, that the cardiogenic shock is treated as a team approach. And there's a cardiogenic shock team that's composed of an advanced heart failure cardiologist, a heart failure surgeon like Dr. Suarez, a critical care intensivist, and, and an uh, interventional cardiologist. So there's at least four different physicians representing uh, different uh, perspectives so that we get together, assess the, the patient identify the appropriate form of shock, and so that we can come to a multidisciplinary discussion as to how best to, to treat that patient. So I, I think those are all important things to, to note for, uh, for going in the future. And for people out there also, an extension of that, I think the multidisciplinary approach has shown that it improves outcome. People do do better. And now extending that concept to multi-institutional, where you do have system processes, like Dr. Kinyun was saying, you'll save someone, but if you send them out somewhere where they'll do well, that's a failure as well. It's something we can do better. And so if you're out there, it's, I mean, it, trying to, to extend out uh, lines of communication is probably the, the most important thing to really take the next step up in, in improving how people do. We know how, how, how it's going from an individual practitioner to a team practitioner to a multi-institutional uh, practice where people have different resources at different places where we can really deliver the type of care and outcomes that, that people deserve. I think that's the next challenge we have in front of us. So wherever you are, you can help out in, in communicating with other people around you, your, your the other providers in your area to help kind of create a, 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 a team experience that extends beyond just your institution. And I think that's the next challenge that we face. Yeah. Thank you for those comments. So in the last few seconds, I'm just looking at questions that we've had from the outside. And we may not have done a perfect job, but I think many of the questions that have been asked, in a way or another, we have covered them, perhaps not exactly as best as the person who asked the question wanted, but I think we have covered most of the topic. There's one question that I'm going to take because we probably should mention. Somebody asked, can echo replace his one guns in somebody with cardiogenic shock? And I've spent 40 years doing echoes, and I think I'm a little good at it. And the answer is no. You would have to be sitting there with the patient constantly making Doppler, cardiac output, trying to estimate fitting pressure, trying to estimate PA pressure, and still, 
even if you did that, uh, you, you would still be in trouble because with ECHO, we get some general idea of where hemodynamics are, but this minute-to-minute -minute assessment cannot really be done. So the answer to that is no. Well, I want to thank everybody, uh, Dr. Bimaraj. Thank you so much for putting this together, and particularly thank you for being the guest editor for this issue. By the way, we have received a lot of positive comments. I think uh, it's an issue that people have liked, and I encourage all of you to, um, to read it and go to it. Um, and of course, I want to thank our panelists. I think uh, the hour went fast, uh, but I think we had a very nice discussion. So, so with that, uh, we say good night to all of you, and stay tuned with uh, the Bakey Education. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank, Thank you. Night. you.